is a special lecture, a special presentation, because we have 52 weeks, and so this is a rare interval between the two halves of our course. Not halves so much, but the two years which form a pair. You know, there's an old saying that a glass half filled, the optimist says it's half full, the pessimist says it's half empty. And then there was a version of that glass full of water where if the glass was full of water, you couldn't add anything to it. And that that was a metaphor for education about 40 years ago that we were inculcated and filled so much with habit that we could not learn anything fresh, we could not learn anything new. And so the style 40 years ago was to find some way to empty yourself out, to get rid of what had been put in you so that you could learn something new, you could come into an experience of, at that time it was called, a radical realization. But the glass half full and the glass completely full are deceiving metaphors for learning, for education, because one can take any amount of liquid in any kind of container and apply enough heat and spin and magnetism, and you can plasma the effect and come up with a form which is so distributed that all of the emptiness and all of the fullness is equally present everywhere. To polymerize a plasma like this in a high-level magnetic field is a part of the reality of the cosmos. And this education addresses itself to the way in which beings of our type can mature and be at home on that scale of the real. And so it's a different sort of learning from the one in which we would find in any kind of an education in an ordinary way. And yet, this education is traditional in the sense that it is a development of wisdom educations going back many thousands of years. In fact, I trace it back at least 40,000 years. It goes back to the old primordial Paleolithic cave art and matures itself all the way through a whole sequence of historical phases. And one of the driving, synthesizing elements in that kind of a history, that kind of a chronological development, that kind of a phase form maturation, one of the driving engines for the integration is time. And the time factor is something that I want to take a look at today in the sense of a periodicity of time which occurs in language and also learning. And this periodicity is very often just colloquially called cadence. This storyteller's cane from Cameroons, West Africa, is the way in which an old African storyteller would keep his cadence. And yet, if you look at the symbolic storyteller's cane, though it's made in 1970s Cameroon, the head is an ancient Egyptian scepter. This was the sign of the king in ancient Egypt, and one used this not just to keep cadence for telling stories, but to establish the authority 
of delivering the cosmos to human life, for that was the old Pharaonic meaning of this particular symbol. And so a really primordial wisdom education delivers a bridge to the cosmos for those beings who would like to find a maturation to not equal that of the universe, but to emerge completely beyond uh, integral form into a differential consciousness whose harmonic is the cosmos itself. This precludes an education that limits itself to the mind. And this goes beyond the liminal boundedness of ideas and mental form. And so it presents a very difficult uh, series of problems. It itself, as a strategy, is problematic. And though it was done in ancient times by rare individuals for themselves, generally guided by someone who had done this before them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, there were experiments to try to enlarge this so that there would be a community rather than just someone who learned, some chila, some disciple, some student, some carrier of a lineage, rather than just an individual to have the maturation of a community. And from time to time in the history of our species, those communities did emerge, they did exist, sometimes for quite some long while. In classical Greece, the Pythagorean original mystical communities lasted for about ten generations before they too went the way of all flesh. The way of all flesh is not a flaw in us. The lack of permanency in forms having to do with ourselves is not a Gnostic indication that we are flawed or that the universe is flawed. It's simply that the time vector, which is the most primordial dimension in the universe, must continue. And if it doesn't continue to continue, then it naturally regresses. It has a regressive quality, which is completely natural to it, and there is a devolution as well as an evolution from the same momenta. So that one of the qualities of a wisdom education is to build in a kind of an encompassing strategy that co-opts that natural tendency of time and we would call this in mathematics, instead of a regression, a recursion. To recursively come back for a moment and pick up a stitch and then go forward again. In one of his great speeches when the Chinese John Wayne was still a champion of his people, Mao Zedong said, the way to advance is one step back and two steps forward. That you build in a recursion element into the dynamic itself. We now would style this a little bit differently. We would say that we put a self-correcting algorithm into the genetic uh, process of generating the field of possibility. And indeed, we do that. We do that everywhere except in education. And education is still where it was left, dead, more than 40 years ago. And this education has uh, undergone a tremendous uh, development uh, since then. And I thought you might like to see some of the evidences of its history of how it got to be what it is today. I looked back through dozens of boxes. I couldn't find the 
original course. It's still there someplace hidden. The original course that came into this education that you have before you today was offered at San Francisco State in uh, 1965, late 65, early 66, and it was a course on the Renaissance, and it was styled the Hermetic Renaissance, and it was an invitation at that time to reconsider that the San Francisco of 1966 was very similar to the Florence of uh, 1446 that there was a recursion element that was going back some 520 years and catching up something, bringing something forward in a massive catching up of a stitch, and that was that the ancient wisdom learning of the Egyptian, Greek, India focus that had been the pinnacle of educational wisdom learning about 300 A.D. and had largely faded from the scope of Western history, was picked up again in the early 15th century in Florence. And the figure who most poignantly shepherded this renaissance was a man named Cosmo de' Medici. And Cosmo de' Medici, who had uh, suffered great ignominy from his fellow Florentines, they had exiled him from the city as a young man. He had lost in a Machiavellian power struggle, and he went to Venice to hang out and there in Venice, he, being Cosimo de' Medici, got a brilliant idea. He realized that the city of Byzantium, that Constantinople, was going to fall to the Muslim besiegers of the city, led by Mahmoud II, and that the last traces of power and authority and lineage from the ancient world, which had all this time been preserved in Byzantium, that the classic heritage of ancient Athens and ancient Alexandria and ancient Rome that had been moved to Constantinople by the Emperor Constantine I that Constantinople become Byzantium, still held the living seed, the little Promethean fire, the pilot light of ancient civilization, and that there was going to be a mass exodus of the last holders of all of these lineages from Byzantium, and they were going to come to the West, they were going to come particularly to Italy, they were going to come to Venice, and Cosimo de' Medici, who arranged behind the scenes for his competitors to be exiled themselves from Florence, and he invited back, got the venue of this great ecumenical meeting of the last pilot light of antiquity, lighting the new flame of a renaissance, he got the venue moved from Venice to Florence. And in 1439, there was a universal and ecumenical meeting of East and West, of Roman Catholic and of Orthodox Byzantine, of all of the polarities of the ancient world, and it was held there in Florence, and it was the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. Not that it was the beginning completely, it was a recursion not only back into antiquity, but in Florence some couple of hundred years before Cosmo de' Medici, there had already been a tremendous realization that there was still a lineage to carry on, and the great Florentine poet Dante, writing the Divine Comedy, 
using Virgil, the great epic poet for Roman civilization, as his guide, reinstated a new cosmos, a, instead of a Renaissance cosmos, a continuation of the ancient Roman cosmos into the high medieval Gothic cosmos of the Divine Comedy. And Dante, understanding that Virgil was the Roman version of the Greek Homer, so that he not only brought ancient Rome and its Roman civilization into a new level of high medieval continuity, but he changed the language from Latin to Italian. And so when Cosmo de' Medici started the Italian Renaissance, it was on the basis of transforming a form of high medieval Italian language civilization and not just to bring back the old Latin civilization, not just to bring the Romans back, but to bring the Roman civilization, the ancient Italian civilization, back in the form of transforming Dante's version of it. And so the guide was not Virgil for Cosmo de' Medici. Dante used Virgil as his guide. The guide for Cosmo de' Medici was Plato, because he understood that the Italian civilization of Rome was not original with the Italians, with the Romans, that they had based themselves on ancient Athens, where Plato was the great genius and held forth. And so Cosmo de' Medici did a double recursion. He went back to the Roman classical empire, but not in its Latin language mind, in its Latin language version of its Greek language mind, and sought then to have the most important book to be sequestered secretly out of Byzantium and brought to Italy at that time. It was a complete works of Plato. And so he searched to try to find someone who could learn Greek classically well enough to speak like Plato spoke so that he could translate Plato not only into workable Latin correcting the medieval manuscripts, but translate Plato into an Italian, not just the language, but an Italian, a Florentine Italian, a Florentine Italian Platonic Renaissance lifestyle that we're not after translating a book so much as bringing that pilot flame back into life again. We're going to unwrap the hidden mummies of the past and bring them back to life and have them be our friends and teachers again, and we will live again those ancient lives of high wisdom and take it from here. And so this ambitious plan was thwarted by only one thing. There was no one alive who could do that. But Cosmo de' Medici was unthwarted by that. He decided that he would take a young man, he took the son of his personal physician, and he had little Marsilio Ficino educated in a special way so that he would grow up to be the translator of the ancient Platonic way of life into the modern Florentine Italian Renaissance way of life in the person of a living master. And in the midst of this maturation and the translation of Plato, a master from Byzantium, very esoteric, his name was Pletho, brought secretly to Cosmo de' Medici and he said, you know, the Plato which you're basing your new Italian Renaissance civilization on, had been refined about 500 years after Plato. And it was refined to such an extent that when 
the last of the classical Platonists, his name is Plotinus, refurbished the entire Roman understanding of Greek civilization. Plotinus has never been translated into any modern language. And so Ficino was given the task that he was to translate Plotinus as well as Plato so that one would have the origins of the Greek civilization and the final distilled rare liqueur of that Greek civilization, except that Pletho said, you cannot understand Plotinus. You can't understand how Plotinus relates to Plato. You can't understand Neoplatonism and its relationship to classical Platonism without understanding that there was a fundamental transformation and that that transform had something to do with changing the form of the mind. Plotinus's mind is not just an improvement of Plato's mind. Neoplatonism is not just a further integration of the Platonic integral. Plotinus is a differential range of possibility of transformations that can come out of the Platonic classical mind. So you have to have some understanding of how transforms happen. And that the classic understanding of how transforms happen is what the ancient Hermetic wisdom was all about. That the Hermetic documents, together as they call it the Corpus Hermeticum, the body of Hermetic writings, had appeared in Alexandria about 90 AD and that they were the teaching of the transform, of how you take a classic understanding and transform it into an unlimited range of possibility. And so Cosmo de' Medici used that particular scenario, Plato to the Hermetic transform to Plotinus, and he commissioned uh, Ficino to devote his entire life to this, and, which Ficino did. He interrupted his translation of Plato long enough to translate the Hermetic documents so that the dying Cosmo uh, de Medici could hear them complete on his deathbed, and he was satisfied. And towards the end of his life, Ficino translated all of Plotinus for the first time in s almost, uh, what, 1,300 years, 14? The year was 1492. <coughs> the year that Columbus discovered America, Ficino finished his Plotinus, and the Italian Renaissance reached an apex. And yet, true to the way in which regression is naturally built in to an integral. Exactly at that time, Florence was undergoing a repressive throwback to medieval theology, an ideology of fanatical monks who wanted to purify the people against all of these new things and take them back to the old. And so a monk named Savonarola began executing people and having them put into torture for being participants in the Italian Renaissance in Florence. Savonarola himself was seized by an irate population some years later and burnt publicly at the stake in Florence in front of all of the statues of Michelangelo, in front of the place where Ficino had uh, taught, uh, in front of the Duomo with the Giotto Tower and its Brunelleschi Dome to signal that this regression will not continue and will end. But a variant of that particular Savonarola issue, or what was seen as a variant, several years later came to pass in Northern Europe, and it was the Luther Reformation 
of the entire Roman Empire in the sense of it, the Roman Catholic Church continuing the Roman Empire in a medieval kind of a strategy and structure. All of this was the kind of education that I ran in San Francisco in 1966. My first course was this. This is what I taught 35 years ago. And it was successful beyond belief. And I was asked to present a future course at that time, and I uh, was asked by a group of people from the city of San Francisco and so, as a complement to the Italian Renaissance course, I offered a course on the cosmology of Tyre de Chardin. And then someone at San Francisco State said, you know, your courses are so popular, why don't you do a course which we can put into our curriculum? And I designed a course called Job and Faust, Two Faces of Evil, and this is the original little pink mimeograph sheet from 1967, spring 1967, Job and Faust. I used the King James Version of the Book of Job, the Anchor Bible, Carl Jung's Answer to Job. Uh, the Book of Job is a Greek tragedy by Horace Callan, a friend of John Dewey's. J.B., a play by Archibald MacLeish. Uh, the William Blake Engravings of Job. Rafe von Williams' music for the mask uh, uh, for dancing of Job. I put in Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, Goethe's Dr. Faustus, Thomas Mann's Dr. Faustus, uh, the film uh, that Richard uh, uh, Burton was later to do uh, hadn't come out, but his recording of Marlowe's play was available. Gounod's uh, opera on the Faust. Uh, Bassoni's Dr. Faust uh, opera, Buito's Mephistopheles opera, uh, Berlioz's the, uh, Le Damnation de Faust music, uh, scenes from Goethe's Faust by Schumann, uh, Wagner's Faust overture, Liszt's uh, Faust symphony, and I threw in Shelley's Prometheus Unbound. So I was offering courses like this 35 years ago. The difficulty was not the success. I had more students that I could manage. The difficulty was that it punctured holes in the very program in which I was a teaching assistant. The very academic fabric that I was supposed to be getting advanced degrees in began to fray and be poked through by my activities. At that time, I was in an interdisciplinary program. There were only three of them in the United States at that time. Columbia had one, the University of Chicago had one, and San Francisco State had one. The two coasts and the middle of the country. It was specifically a graduate program of interdisciplinary learning. And yet the interdisciplinary learning was on the basis of subjects which overlap. And everyone assumed that what was interdisciplinary were subjects that overlap. And because you focus on the overlapping, this makes it interdisciplinary, and somehow that's something new. It didn't occur to anyone at the time that this is a regression and doesn't have any algorithmic improvement. All it has is a, they used to call it smushing, a smooshing together so that you got subjects with, they even called the program the University Without Walls. You lost all sense of form and thus the integral synthesizing dynamic and uh, settled for something that was like uh, mush turned to vapor and that was like real cool to have that. There were seminars at the time in the, in the 60s in San Francisco, graduate seminars. I remember one, the leader of the seminar had a 
galvanized wash tub full of cabbages and carrots, raw cabbages and carrots, and he was barefoot soaking his feet in to get the right vibrations. <laughs> and I remember one suited, tied, black man who was trying to do the program to improve himself and was paying hard-earned cash, and he got so fed up one time in this seminar that he slammed his books down, stuffed them into his briefcase, and stomped out. And about 20 minutes later, the professor said, he stole our energy. This kind of vaporous mush doesn't do anything for anyone except make a costume of pretense for phoniness. It didn't do anything at all and prepares a ground for a really deeper regression, uh, one that the country is uh, suffering now. We have people who are going back some 25 or 30 years coming in to think that they're going to do an administration in the 21st century. They were outstripped 25 years ago. This is a peculiarity that education is a learning how to learn primordially. One has to be prepared to be prepared before there is any dynamis. Otherwise, the energy takes you over automatically. And it is the classical Greeks who were the first ones to understand that there is a difference between energeia and dynamis. And the focus of it Though expressed beautifully, ultimately, in Plato, the focus in classical Greece is not in Plato but in Thucydides. It is in Thucydides' history, his history of the Peloponnesian War, that one finds a discussion that the dynamic integration in history, if not consciously paid attention to, takes over the mental structures and throws them into a pretense mode which naturally regresses. And Thucydides says of his own city, Athens, that what started out several hundred years before as a Delian league of colonies that had a common language and homeland turned into an Athenian empire that sought to dominate every little town in Greece, and so, of course, they made a pact among themselves to fight against the Athenian Empire under the village named Sparta. And you set up a Cold War that ruined classical Greece, because after 35 years of war, they were all economically bankrupt. They were all spiritually exhausted, and it was nothing at all for a 20-year-old named Alexander the Great to just march over them without any big battles whatsoever. And Greece became a little province in Alexander's empire. And Athens became a university town. It became about as important as Cambridge, Massachusetts would be, a good university town but you're not going to win national elections and you're not going to fight a Cold War from that basis. One of the difficulties about an education is that it is not real. It will become unreal and increasingly unreal because an education that prepares you to be prepared has a transform that kicks in vision. And without vision, the people perish. Regression will happen whether you want it to or not unless you have a way of algorithmically going back and introducing consciousness to the path integral all the time, every time. The regression is like an infestation of ants. They're always going to be there. <laughs> you have to deal with them all the time, and that's the only way to continue. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, so said uh, Jefferson. So after several 
years, four years in San Francisco of offering courses like this, uh, at the same time as being, being the prize teaching assistant, I was hired to go to Canada to design a complete 16-course interdisciplinary program for a completely new structure. At the time, the province of Alberta was, had more money, more oil money, than Saudi Arabia. They gave back money to every citizen of the province. They gave them several thousand dollars every year because they had such a surplus. After they spent everything they could, they still had hundreds of millions of dollars in surplus. So they decided to have the best schools, the best hospitals, the best roads, and in building a school in Calgary, which was the center of the oil money, 400 oil companies had their head office in uh, Calgary. When I went there first, it had 300,000 people. And when I left five years later, it had 700,000 people. They had unlimited money to build the ideal utopian university. And they brought in the best educational future planners, and they decided that instead of having a traditional university, they would have a variety of this university without walls. And so architecturally, it was designed by a company, uh, the name of the company were Stanton Leggett and Associates, who had built City College of Chicago. And they specialized in a kind of a second-hand Le Corbusier architecture. That is to say, Le Corbusier had stressed that bare cement was beautiful to show the power of form in architecture. The borrowing of this was by a man named Mario Campi, who left the wood grain of the constructs so that the bare cement, cement would have wood grain uh, texture on the surface. And uh, so they built a 15-acre building that had no walls, that it had uh, exterior kinds of supports that went up about 50 or 60 feet, and huge football field-sized uh, domes everywhere. S and they had three floor levels that you could look uh, across as if it were like uh, maybe 20 parking lots. And in this huge spaceship of a building, a new kind of education was supposed to happen where you didn't study subjects, but you studied interdisciplinary ways of shifting your focus. And my responsibility was to design the program that would make all of this come true. And so I went up at 29 years of age and worked on this and designed it, designed the whole thing. And this was the initial statement. In general education, the idea is to fill in the gaps and interrelational spaces that have naturally developed in the contemporary world as a residual of increasing specialization. This specialization has taken the prominent form of well-defined subjects and accurately delineated processes. The universal application of the scientific method to entities and the logical analysis to procedure has benefited everyone by presenting reasonably clear pictures of the world. In this act of focusing, however, the background has been eliminated. The interconnecting tissue of things and their movement has disappeared, not from reality, as is so ignorantly lamented, but merely from man's microscoped perspective. This program restores the consciousness of this background and the requisites of human character commensurate with that restoration. Let's take a break. Before the break, I stressed the Western 
part of a set. And for me, I'm rather ambidextrous, Asian wisdom is as comfortable for me as uh, the Western tradition. And I thought you um, might be interested that being raised in the United States in the 40s, no one ever told us about anything Asian. And so it came as quite a surprise to me that I could understand such things as if they were familiar. And I remember the first time getting into one of those proverbial university arguments. I was a freshman at the University of uh, Wisconsin, 1958, and we got into one of these long discussions, and finally, an Indian man, he was a soil agronomist from central India, he's from Nagpur in the Deccan, and he took me aside and he said, you Westerners are so ignorant. You don't understand anything at all. You think that you know, and you're just clanking around in your mind with ideas that are undigested. And before you go to sleep tonight, you are going to hear some Asian wisdom to open your eyes. And so Mr. Puri, his name was Sudarshan Puri, started telling me basic insight, wisdom from the Bhagavad Gita. And it turned out that I was evidently a very good listener. And so he spent the entire winter's evening, we started walking, went out of the bar, and of course the bar is closed about two in the morning, and the University of Wisconsin is on the shores of Lake Mendota. And directly across Lake Mendota is the insane asylum. And uh, there was always a joke that when winter got really severe, the students could easily go home. <laughs> so he turned out to be quite a learned soil agronomist, and he began reciting the Bhagavad Gita and in Sanskrit, and then explicating. And by the end of the evening, he was astounded. He said, um, you must have had previous lives. There's no way to account for this. So he gave me a book to read. It was by Heinrich Zimmer called Six Philosophies of India. And of course, uh, I was at that time in electrical engineering, and it seemed to me very strange. There was no mention of thermionic emissivity of molten metals or anything that I was interested in. And uh, as I began to read, I realized that there was a whole other tradition from the West that was quite learned and quite sophisticated. And in fact, in time, when I was at San Francisco State working on the beginnings of disenchantment with education, one of my major professors was uh, Kaiyushu. Kaiyushu was um, not only uh, professor of humanities. He was also the editor of the Chinese World Newspaper in San Francisco. And he had been an interpreter for the American commando units during the Second World War. Uh, his teacher in Nanjing had been Wen Yi Tu, the very great uh, Chinese poet of the 20th century, uh, who was machine gunned in front of his students by uh, the Japanese in the uh, rape of Nanjing to show the Chinese intellectuals that they were in charge. I remember during the worst of the riots at San Francisco State, I, was, um, I had been selected as the only graduate from San Francisco State in 1968. Out of 20,000 students, they graduated one person, me. And uh, Kaiyushu said, we will not be intimidated by riots on whatever scale. Um, if I survive the Japanese rape of Nanjing, we are not going to be shut down completely. And so I was selected to be the only graduate. And be being the only graduate, my orals were held uh, off campus with about 25 professors. And I was saved from hours and hours and hours of grilling. After two or three hours, uh, um, 
one of my professors, Jacob Needleman, professor of philosophy, said, this man needs a drink. And he brought out the champagne, and he was very wise. He knew that the faculty would get into the champagne. <laughs> and they got into arguing with each other, and I was spared any further. <laughs> I learned from Caillou that there was a profound difference between China and India, that while India was cognate with the West, that uh, China was uh, completely on the other side of possibility, that the only way that East and West meet is in a complementarity. They do not even polarize, that there is a completely different outlook and take so that it is not a polarity, but it is if there was a diagonal in a contrapositive way. China, in its ancient wisdom tradition, is the inside-out obverse of the Western wis wisdom tradition. And so I applied myself to catching up and to learning. And in fact, when I was taken to Canada, by an invitation to design this interdisciplinary program, the first lecture I gave was on the Bhagavad Gita. And because the school was not built yet, it was held in the city planetarium, which was the only environment that was able to handle the kind of, quote, courses that I was uh, designing and planning to give. And then when I learned that it would be in the planetarium, I, of course, designed a planetarium show to go with the lecture. And I had them play a Ravi Shankar composition on the loudspeakers. It was a composition that he introduced to the Monterey Pop Festival that year. It was called Dun. And it was a raga based on American bluegrass. And uh, we had that playing and the cosmological show and my lecture on the Bhagavad Gita and uh, at 29, I was still rather torrential, pacing tiger. And afterwards, the director of the planetarium offered me a job. He said, you know, there isn't a dry seat in the house. <laughs> Sig had a homey way of making his points. But the favorite text that I worked with in those days and still forms the fount out of which this education begins is the I Ching that the I Ching is an extraordinary fount. It is the Chinese traditional way in which civilization in East Asia generates itself out of the set of zero and one. That there is no way to have a beginning, that the beginning at any particular directive oneness, any starting point, generates a falsity which eventually ends up in dead issue cycling, cloning, and does not lead to any kind of a fruitful return and a regeneration. So the I Ching became um, a foundational work for the education. And uh, the beginning of the education always starts with the I Ching. There was, at the time also, a problem because of trying to find a way to introduce the ancient East and the ancient West into contemporary version, that I looked for ways not to overlap so much, but to get a synergy in the integral and a multi-dimensional range in the differential. And uh, one of the things, uh, just to give you an example, in the classic West, um, the understanding was that human spiritual personality was such a complex form that it could not be seen against any kind of a natural background. That spiritual man was such a scintillating complexity 
that the natural context within which he could be seen was an insufficient background and dulled the presentation of self, as we would say, sociologically. And so in uh, the early second century AD, the great intellect of that age was uh, Plutarch. Plutarch devised a method by which the Greek form of conscious person could be seen not against a background of nature, but against a background of another person. So that in order to present the complexity of the differentially conscious person, you set it in a complementarity of parallel lives, that you paired lives together, and that you could only see a human life against the com comparative background of another human life. And so the parallel lives was an educational technique in the early second century AD of uh, the great uh, Hermetic West uh, uh, tradition, the Neoplatonic uh, Platonic, uh, Hermetic West. So I sought uh, to try to find a way to do a parallel lives in the Plutarchian tradition, but to use as the lives Asian figures. And so uh, here is uh, a course from uh, 1974. The parallel lives are Mao Zedong and Mahatma Gandhi, using a life from India and a life from China in a Western Platonic uh, method of teaching so that instead of having an overlap of subjects be interdisciplinary, that it was truly an algorithmic, uh, self-correcting, interpenetrative complementarity that was being delivered. And uh, I must say that this was not being delivered to intellectuals, but to um, young Canadian adults, 18, 19, 20 years of age. It was enormously successful. There were hundreds of people who signed up every time it was offered. I made the mistake one time of not putting a population limit on the symbols course, and when it got uh, nearly 400 people, the administration called and said, you've, you've got to do something. We have almost 400 people in this course. And one of the Canadian rules in academia was that uh, after a certain number, I think it was 90, you had to technically, legally have a teaching assistant for every 13 people over that number. So I had this huge room full of teaching assistants that were brought in. Of course, they didn't know anything. They didn't know the material. They didn't know how to teach, especially the new style that I was pioneering. And so I added them to the student body. So I had this huge auditorium of people, rather frightening at the time because there were a lot of faculty members who were beginning to try to use some of these techniques for themselves. So I would have sometimes more than 500 people being taught. And of course, this was in a university without walls beyond belief, a 15-acre building. Um, one of the techniques that I used was uh, curious. Uh, because the expanse was carpeted in uh, a kind of a fireball orange indoor-outdoor carpeting. And because the huge uh, football field skylights let in too much sun that triggered the, um, the uh, fire extinguishing, uh, and you get water all the time, so they opaque these skylights, which meant that it was too dark. And because the ceilings were these concrete uh, honeycombs about 60 feet above the floor, they had to have really powerful lights to get down, so they used mercury arc vapor lamps, like parking lot lamps. And uh, they finally had to have these five-foot-high room dividers, they called them, that were portable, and you could move them around. And they were carpeted with purple indoor-outdoor carpeting. So you had the mercury uh, vapor lamps, you had the purple and the fireball orange. It was curious because after an hour in the building, you could blink your eyes and you could see a cacophony of all the images you had just looked at. So uh, being industrious, um, I took a cue from the Inuit people, the Eskimo, uh, 
and I designed uh, these glasses that would have these narrow slits that the Eskimo used to prevent snow blindness. And students would go around with these little slit glasses. They looked like space beings. <laughs> and because I always had these projects, people were making sculptures and paintings and you know hands-on stuff. And because I would have hundreds of students, and after five years I'd had thousands of students, and I had this archaeological mound of all their projects and stuff. And uh, travelers from all over the world would come through the building and they would see this archaeological dig, this tell, this creative mound of stuff. And of course, it became cause celeb time. This is the way in which the parallel lives of Gandhi and Mao Zedong in the Plutarchian parallel lives was described uh, in the early 70s. China and India include nearly half the human race in their burgeoning populations of one and a half billion persons. It's now two and a half. Two minds dominate this half of humanity in the 20th century, Gandhi and Mao. We must make some effort to understand we simply cannot ignore half the world. <coughs> to appreciate Mao, Zhou, and Lai must be included in this study. They are inseparable. And of course, I used Kai Yushu's great biography of Mao, of uh, Zhou and Lai. He subentitled his biography of Zhou and Lai China's Gray Eminence. Gray Eminence is the appellation for Cardinal Richelieu in. Uh, uh, Louis XIV's France. Zhou Enlai, as Gai Yushu portrayed, was a classical Taoist master who never was number one but was always number two, was always the background substructure recalibrating all the time everything that Mao Zedong did. So that when Mao Zedong died, China didn't revert back to a pre Mao Zedong or to some second rate version of Mao Zedong, but it became a Zhou and Lai transformational structure. Uh, Deng and uh, all of the Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, People today running uh, China are all very uh, conscious of um, uh, differentially conscious history. The first chapter in Kaiyu Shu's Zhou Enlai is two mothers and six uncles that Zhou Enlai learned from a little boy how to live in a household where there were two powerful women and many men who were trying to organize factions to work their way between these two powerful women. So Zhou Enlai raised himself as a little boy to be the ultimate diplomat to get things done, weaving one's way not in between polarities of two different warring factions, but how to get something really done that you would like to have done and get both sides to fight about who was going to help you most. So just as Zhou Enlai was necessary to understand Mao Zedong, in appreciating Gandhi, Vinoba is essential. Vinoba Bhave, uh, still unknown in the West, uh, Vinoba was one of the most incredible figures in uh, world history. Vinoba was an intellectual prodigy who was raised uh, by his mother to be, uh, in ancient Judaism, the idea was uh, put into the term Nazarite. Uh, the first Nazarite in Jewish history was Samuel, the prophet Samuel. That is to say, he was consecrated to the service of God before he was born, when he was in his mother's womb. Uh, Jesus is not of Nazareth as a place. He's a Nazarite. He's consecrated to God's service before he's born. That's the true meaning of that. Vinoba was that in India. And his mother consecrated him because she lived in an India where Gandhi was really the working spiritual force. 
He was consecrated to help Gandhi, and when he was 20 years of age, his mother sent him to Gandhi. And when he arrived, Gandhi was astounded by the capaciousness of this young man. He was truly astounding. He was an intellectual prodigy of the first order. And so Gandhi said, I want you to go to the center of India and establish an ashram, and instead of teaching others, teach yourself. And I want you to teach yourself every religion in the world. And so Vinoba, at 20, went there. Gandhi had given him the proviso that he would like a report after a year to see how he was doing. And uh, true to form, because he was a karma yogi of the highest order, Vinoba appeared to the minute a year later to let him know that he had begun. And that ashram today in the center of India, the geographic center, it's out in the deserts in the very center, it's called Wardha. Wardha, W-A-R-D-H-A, Wardha. And so Vinoba taught himself every language in the world. And he read all the religious documents in the original, in Arabic, in Greek, in Latin, in Sanskrit, in Chinese. He read them all. And when he was ready to be called at long last, when in the throes of the Second World War, Gandhi wanted to initiate a satyagraha. Satya means truth, graha means grasping. A truth grasping campaign, not a polarity of holding up protest signs, but someone to initiate a complementarity generating reality seed. A satyagraha is someone who initiates a truth holding seed into reality. So it's not only a karma yoga as an integral, but it's also a differential kind of a yoga. It's known sometimes as raja yoga, the kingly yoga, because it uh, applies to everyone for all time, the entire range of human possibility. And so Vinoba, being a great Raja and Karma Yogi together, was chosen by Gandhi to be the first Satyagrahi in his campaign to wake the world up in 1942. And of course, Vinoba was arrested immediately and put into prison and not let out until um, the late 40s, not let out until Gandhi had died. And so Vinoba was very much like Gampopa vis-a-vis -vis Milarepa. He thought that he would never get a chance to serve something that he had been born to because his master had died. He wasn't there anymore. And he didn't know what to do. And like Gampopa, Vinoba wandered for several years trying to find what to do. And for Vinoba, because he had spent all of his life literally in just a few places. His mother's home, Warda, the British prison. He began walking, and he walked all over India, and he's known today as the walking saint. And he came upon a technique called sarvodaya. Not the service to a master, sarvo means service. Daya means, it comes from the Sanskrit word for heart. It means service of the heart for all. Service to man, not as mankind as a form, but to the whole potential of our maturation, which is far beyond what we are currently or ever have been. We are scarcely embryos of what we really are. And this uh, development uh, from Vinoba changed the whole face of India. It's still not reported in the West, but there are several hundred million people living in Sarvodaya uh, informed societies and Satyagraha seeded uh, spiritual lives in India. So along with Joe and Lai and Mao Zedong, Vinoba and Gandhi, I not only did a parallel lives of Mao and Gandhi, but I brought in Joe and Lai and Vinoba also in a paradness that you had a pair of pairs. 
You had the ancient hermetic pair of pairs square, which was not just a square as a form, but was a quaternary as a differential range. Because once you have a quadratic form like that, you can produce all kinds of differential functions, analytical possibilities that would never have occurred in nature, would never have occurred in just a mere integral. While integrals are very strong and they're very powerful, they're quite limited. Their largest field of activity is the mind. And reality, on the level of a spiritual person, so outstrips the mind's limitations as to be almost comical. That's why it's called a divine comedy, because the cosmos is the largest form of a differential person. So I, uh, in this uh, syllabus description, write, Asia is already here on the national personage of Japan, but Japan is just a bit, a preliminary of what Asia is in total and will be inevitably for us now in the emerging world. We must look to it. The imperatives used above are not placebos of sentiment, but used in recognition, recognition of a necessary task. The confrontation with Asia is the whole future. The whole of Europe in the coming world is just another country. Its total history and heritage, just another nationalism in this new world order. Thus, this course, realistic, necessary. That was 26 years ago. This was the kind of language used for the symbols course in 1975. An interdisciplinary learning situation moving by person discovery rather than by abstract definition. We develop patterns rather than prove models. Prepare to be prepared. We respond to process rather than react to things, preferring relation and function rather than chain and command. Rejecting the closed and manipulative circles of magic incantation and rituals, as well as those of logic, validity, and languages, we note the continuity and discontinuity of experience emerging through rituals and languages to the expression of human meaning and symbolic form we transform ritual awareness and linguistic structures into symbolic meaningfulness. We create an environment wherein the student as subject matter and energy can act freely in self-recognition. Your world is there. Symbols just focus your attention. And so eventually an entire eight-part program was developed by the summer of 1975, all of the recognizable first year is there. None of the second year is there. By 1975, the pioneering of this particular form had mastered the integral ecology, but was as yet unknowing of the full range of the differential complement to it. There was nature as the beginning, and the second phase was ritual, as we have. The third phase, mythology. The fourth, symbols. But the fifth phase, which is vision now, was called at that time ideas, showing that the understanding was still projective from mentality. Because it's very difficult to do an end run around thinking with thought. It can't be done. The end run is not done on the basis of thinking about thought, but of transforming awareness into consciousness, which is a different thing, totally. It has a relationship between spirit and body rather than between spirit and mind. The body takes transform quicker than the mind. Bodies are made to transform. 
they transform existence into experience naturally. And so they take transform much more readily. The mind, being already a higher level of integral, the transform has to be a much finer wrought. You cannot transform the mind without an undistilled liqueur of um, consciousness. Whereas the body uh, can be transformed by consciousness, raw as it comes, out of pure vision. The uh, sixth phase that, was, that now is art was at that time, 25 years ago, called groundings. And it was paired, perception and language. Still, obviously, ideas of the mythic horizon being projected out. The seventh development, it's called developments. What now is history? But the example was historical periods. And so history was already nascently there as a differential phase process. The eighth was called explorations, and the example was parallel lives. And of course, science is that uh, today. And the move from explorations in parallel lives to science is rather a very complex, long, ranging um, development. By 1975, I had um, developed the entire situation and thought that I would apply myself not in Canada but in the United States. I was asked to give up my American citizenship to stay in the privileged position that I was in. I had been given tenure. So I was a tenured professor, the head of the department, and the designer of the whole program. And I quit. I made the, uh, the, the foolish mistake of resigning on April 1st, 1975, and they thought it was an April Fool's joke. No tenured professor had ever quit. Uh, so I came to the United States with the idea that I would explore what was going on educationally. So I had my secretaries send out 60 letters to various places to see what kind of programs they had so I could go and visit, and I didn't get a single response. There were replies that we don't have jobs, that you have to go through channels, and I wasn't asking that at all. And it occurred um, quite poignantly that by 1975, I had outstripped the capacity for the educational establishment to hear me. I remember in correspondence with uh, Norman O. Brown at the University of California, Santa Cruz, which in the mid-60s had developed a history of consciousness program. And they brought in such great figures as Maurice Nathanson of uh, phenomenological existential uh, fame, uh, Paige Smith, the great American historian, uh, Sidney Tolman, the great uh, English uh, developer of the history of science and philosophy of science, plus Norman O. Brown himself, who had been a great classical scholar. His first book was called Hermes the Thief, uh, and who had become famous in the 60s for a book called Love's Body and a life against death. And Brown wrote back, he said, we have all left and I am leaving. There's nothing here. The University of California has ground our program back into a degree granting subject matter oriented pablum. None of us will be here, don't come. So I searched around, came down, came to Los Angeles, and I found someone who was conscious and alert, an executive of a university who was truly magnificently able to understand because he was an engineer, an aeronautical engineer, and he was also a mathematician. And uh, his name was B.J. Shell. He was the president of Northrop University in Englewood. And so I was invited to design the humanities program for Northrop University by President Schell. And we were all set to offer it. 
I worked on it in 75 and 76. And just as we were about to initiate it and offer it, Iran had a revolution, and the Ayatollah Khomeini came in. And overnight, 25% of the student body of Northrop University, who were Iranis, were cut off from funds, and all development was curtailed. Northrop at that time had just opened a law school, and they had to keep that going because they had a program already. And so my program was put on the back burner because of the Iranian Revolution. And of course, when you look at the Omanic, the Oman, I had left Iran out of the whole range of development. <laughs> God forgives but does not forget. There's <laughs> a peculiar way in whatever language of saying you. <laughs> well, I have made amends. I learned enough Avestic, ancient Avestic language uh, is the ancient language of the Iranian people thousands of years ago, and helped make a complete translation of the Gathas of Zarathustra a number of years ago, and have translated uh, um, a whole sheaf of Rumi out of Farsi so that at least those amends have been made. But the interesting thing was just as the Iranian chink missing was made manifest, the whole development of Buddhist involvement, not the Bhagavad Gita, but of Buddhism in a very peculiar way. Uh, I have to explain because uh, some of you are, are not um, uh, acquainted the original Buddhism of the historical Buddha is a transform of a distillation of Hindu wisdom that occurs in the Upanishads. The great Vedas that structured the core of Indian wisdom traditions for a thousand years eventually became distilled in little parts of large wisdom scriptures, the kernels of those wisdom scriptures were the Upanishads. And the range of Upanishads, or about a dozen or so major ones, underwent a transformation by the historical Buddha. So that the original Buddhism is a double distilled Vedic quality. And because it's double distilled, the original Buddhism, it is um, called Theravada, the way of the ancient ones. And it meant not the ancient ones as in ancient society, but the ancient ones in terms of ancient existence. The historical Buddha said, I am not the first Buddha. I am the latest Buddha. I am not the last Buddha. And that the original lineage of the Buddhas goes back into geologic time. Deepankara taught enlightenment kalpas ago. And I bring it back into play. And just as my teachings are brought back into play now, the veiled resistance of the time dimension will water down these teachings also. And there will come a time when it looks like a subject of ridicule for those searching for wisdom. And at that time, another Buddha will come, Maitreya. And that Buddha will bring that teaching back. Well, that Buddhism, that Theravada became transformed triply. It was a triple transform of uh, about the first century of the Common Era, the first century AD. And it was triply transformed once out of the distilled Upanishad by the historical Buddha, and the second time that distillation was again distilled, even more refined, by such an unlikely candidate as Hellenistic Judaism. 
the first work that mentions the word Mahayana is by Ashvagosha, and uh, it is called the awakening of faith in the Mahayana. And faith is a, a Jewish concern. It is not a concern of the Vedas. It is not a concern of the Upanishads. It is not a concern of the Theravada Buddhism. It is a concern of Judaism. The awakening of faith, uh, the San Sanskrit word is Shraddha. And Shraddhapada, the way of faith, was introduced into India by a man named Thomas, a disciple of Jesus named Thomas. And Thomas went to India about 40 AD. He went to southern India. He went to Kerala. In fact, his tomb is available to be seen there. And within 50 years, the influence of Thomas's, the Gospel of Thomas, or the sayings of Jesus in seed value. You can read the Gospel of Thomas. There are 117 seeds. And what they are, are seeds for unfolding differential consciousness rather than in growing attached to a traditional integral. It's a way of making the personal prison give a, not a fractionization, not a defracting, but a differentiating of uh, the seeds that language, the pithic language phrases that perform the transformation of symbolic uh, understanding into vision. The Gospel of Thomas is all about how vision matures out of the seeds in the mind by transforming mythic language into the magical language of uh, spiritual disclosure. Not the mythic language of stories, but the conscious language of disclosure. And uh, Ashvagosha founded in his little book that came out about 90 AD, about the same time that the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, was written. About the same time that the Hermetic books were written, the Corpus Hermeticum, about 90 AD. And Ashvagosha founded Mahayana, as opposed to the Theravada, which was a distillation of India Vedic India was distilled by the liqueur of the Upanishads, and that distilled again by the Buddha into Theravada, and that radically transformed into the Mahayana, which became a completely different spread. And so uh, I worked to bring the translation of the Mahayana into its jet stream version, which is called the Vajrayana. And the Vajrayana means diamond vehicle. In 1975, I brought uh, Karma Tinley to Los Angeles to teach the Tibetan language and the Karmapas history and Tibetan Buddhism. So, uh, because I found coming back to the United States that uh, almost no one understood at all, had no idea that the Tibetan language is not a folk language. It was tailored and made, like the city of San Francisco, to be expressive of differential conscious disclosure and had no mythic origins. It was designed and made from the beginning, from the get-go, to be a conscious disclosure medium. Thus, it is a uh, a different sort of language from all of the other languages of the world. We've run out of time, and uh, I will eventually write a book and uh, discuss the mounds and mounds of explorations, and uh, hopefully that'll come out. Next week, we begin with vision, and we begin our year-long adventure and learning, as Alfred North Whitehead called it. An adventure in learning that consciousness dwarfs the mind and its capacities are unbelievable because they're not based on belief.
they're based on adventure. 